Hey folks, Brian Keane here. I want to take a moment to talk to you about Subculture Corsets and Clothing, your number one source for all things gothic, steampunk, pinup, and rockabilly. Featuring the very best in alternative clothing for both men and women, including a great assortment of plus-size items, as well as accessories, shoes, books, toys, jewelry, masks, and so much more. Focusing on quality, customer service, and uniqueness, Subculture Corsets is your one-stop shop for everything your alternative lifestyle needs. They have three locations, Jacksonville, Florida, Orlando, Florida, and Atlanta, Georgia. Or you can visit them online from anywhere in the world at subculturecorsets.com. That's subculturecorsets.com. Use the offer code The Horror Show with Brian Keene at checkout and you will receive 10% off your order. Subculturecorsets.com. No comment! Sir, what about the ending to The Rising? Mother f <laughs> What part of no comment don't you understand? Do you understand this? This interview is over. No comment! The f Brian Keene was also unavailable for comment. Welcome back to The Horror Show, brought to you by the Project Entertainment Network. I am your host, Brian Keen. With me this week, co-host number one, Mr. Dave Thomas. Uh, that's me. And co-host number two, Miss Mary San Giovanni. Hi there. <laughs> we got an almost full house this week. If you're a new listener, uh, Dave and Mary are, are both co-hosts with myself, along with uh, other additional co-hosts, filmmaker Mike Lombardo, author-turned-medic Jeff Cooper, Dave's girlfriend, Phoebe, who is the super, super fan, and <laughs> my nine-year-old Dungeon Master 77.1. But today, you've got the three of us. Uh, if you're a new listener, you might be listening to us on iTunes. You might be listening to us online via Project Entertainment's website. Uh, we're available everywhere, Google Play Music, Stitcher, Roku. Um, we thank you for tuning in. If you like what you hear Go to our website, thehorrorshowwithbriankeen.com, and click on the Archives tab, and every single show we've done during our three-year run is there in order. You can listen to them at your leisure. Um, there's nothing good on television right now until Better Call Saul comes. Well, no, that's, that's a lie. Happ and Leonard is on. Well, so. no, this is actually a great week for television, because Better Call Saul, we're recording this on Monday. It starts tonight. Right. Season three, right? Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that's on. Happ and Leonard is on. And Happ and Leonard's been amazing yes. this season. And there's a new episode of The Expanse this week. So that's three amazing TV wow. shows. And if you have Hulu, all of season one of Legion is now up on Hulu. Really? So you can watch it there, which I highly recommend. It's weird as fuck, but it's awesome. Right. Yeah. <laughs> now, Dave, it's gorgeous outside. Yes. I want you to notice the lawn is already mowed. I saw that. Um, <laughs> for new listeners who might not be yeah. up on, on everything, we're currently building a brand new recording studio next to the house. And as a result, we're recording this episode in my kitchen. Um, normally, when we do that, if the weather's nice... Uh, the guy who mows my yard decides to show up on whatever day we're recording. We don't <laughs> have that today. However, we do have the neighbor's dog howling in the background. So if, if you hear, oh, yeah. it's not me kicking Mary under the table. <laughs> it's uh, it's the neighbor's yeah, dog. I, I heard that when I got out of my car and I thought maybe there's something weird going on in here, but uh, now it was the neighbor's no, dog. No, what so happens It woke is me up this morning. The dog is blind. Um, oh, that's and sad. And she had two dogs. I... I I'm sure she doesn't mind me talking about yeah. this on the air. I'm not saying her name or where we live. Right. She had two dogs. And the the dog with sight would lead the blind dog around. Oh, She'd sure. strap their collars mm -hmm. together. And, and it was adorable. But the dog with sight died. So now it's just the blind dog. And now anytime she leaves her house, the blind dog howls because he doesn't know where anybody is. So I've, I've learned that if I howl back at him, 
he'll be quiet. He, he has some reassurance that someone's around, but you know, then I don't go over to her home and pet him. So then he wonders where I've gone too. So <laughs> I may have to howl a couple times through this broadcast. Oh, well. That's anyway. no different than yeah. any other Saturday <laughs> night. Not Saturday. really. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I didn't think you were going to tell the public uh, about that. Right? Uh, <laughs> this week's episode... And, and before I get to this week's sponsor, I, I want to mention, we had said earlier in the year, we had a very, very kind and generous anonymous sponsor who bought, how many ads was it, Dave? Three. Four. Four? Yeah. Four, four ads throughout the year. And uh, he or she does not want their identity given. And what they said to do was that whenever these ads run, we're supposed to pick a new author who we believe in and we, who we think has talent, and we're supposed to promote their book. Nice. Uh, this week's ad is one of those ads. So this week's show is brought to you by Husk, by Rachel Autumn Deering. This all-too-real work of horror fiction explores the mind of a young man who has returned to his Kentucky hometown after three years in Afghanistan. He's struggling with PTSD, drug addiction, and self-doubt, but now... Something dark and brooding and mean is about to manifest into his deepest, darkest fears. Husk is available right now on Kindle and in paperback on Amazon.com. Rachel Autumn Deering, of course, no stranger to listeners of this show. Uh, she's been on the show as a guest, and we're looking to have her back later this year. She's going to tell us all about how she quit writing comics and quit writing novels and, and followed Iron Maiden around on the road. <laughs> so... Speaking of Iron Maiden, speaking of metal, uh, later on in the show, super honored, we have Jeff Tate, the original right. lead singer of Queensryche, uh, one of one of heavy metal's most legendary vocalists. I, I say one of the best vocalists in the world, regardless of I genre. Agree. Uh, Mary and I were were lucky enough to spend several hours with him last night, Dave. Um, do you want to hear all about it? Do you? Or, I mean, <laughs> well, is is it part of the interview, or you mean? No, I mean, like, do you want to hear oh, about our experience? Oh, yeah, yeah, no, does that not interest you? No, well, nothing interests me. You know that, no, okay. <laughs> except, except money, but um, <laughs> and punching stupid people. Well, Queens, right? You know, uh, one of my favorite favorite bands of all time. I mean, you know, my 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 top three are Prince, my top four Prince, Faith No More, Queens, right, and Johnny Cash. Um, and you know, to to be able to to spend some time off the record with Jeff Tate, just hanging out right. and chilling and talking as fellow creatives was fucking awesome. Mary kept asking me if I was nervous, and, and I, I genuinely wasn't. You know, I, I, right. I, I wanted to talk to the guy as, as a creative, as a fellow artist, and, and just hear about his process. So that's what we did for the interview, but we talked a lot off the air as well. He's, he's got just such a fascinating outlook on art, in creating it, and, and what surprised me, I think Mary surprised you as well, is his method is very similar to my own. Yes. Uh, you know, write every day, treat it like a job. You know, and he, just become immersed in it, you know, to just shut out everything else. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like the the tour manager was telling us, you know, all the drama that takes place on, on their bus, which happens in, in any creative. And then, yeah. I had it drama all throughout my tour last year, but, <laughs> it, you know, Jeff just fucking divorces himself from it and right. just sits at the back of the bus and works on his shit. So I thought that was cool. Um, the concert itself, if you're a Queensryche fan and you have not seen this show, you, um, should. you really should. I think they're, the last three dates are all in Canada, right? Uh, yeah, I think he said Ottawa. Ottawa and, and Toronto. Quebec City. And then Toronto. Right. Um, it's one of the best Queensryche concerts I've seen. I, I've seen Queensryche, I think, 11 or 12 times. Yeah, um, yeah. And it's a very passionate set, uh, a very energetic set, and his voice really sounds good. Oh, um, yeah. You know, it lent itself very well to this acoustic setting. Um, and he told a great story about Johnny Cash, Dave, but I, I know you're not a Cash fan, so... We won't. You can tell it if you want. Yeah, it just... It was, it was really cute. It was kind of... Kind of like listening talking to Talking about like, when they when they recorded Mind Crime, they went to uh, Nashville to record it, and, you know, he felt very out of his limit out of place, you know, it's the country music capital of the world. Um, and he went to this pancake house for breakfast and he, he sits there and he orders his food and uh, he looks up and he realizes that everybody in the restaurant is a country and Western singer. And 
sure enough, Johnny Cash is sitting at the table next to him. And Jeff Tate's going through this whole thing in his head like, I'm nobody. Can should I, go, I go talk to should him? Should I go talk to him? And he's debating with himself, you know, whether whether to go talk to Johnny Cash or not. He ultimately he does not, but he watches Johnny Cash eat his breakfast. And he says the man <laughs> could really put away the pancakes. It was it was so funny. So, and, and I don't want to talk to him. And in the end, I couldn't. So I watched Johnny Cash eat pancakes with syrup and just a little bit of whipped cream because he's watching his weight. <laughs> <laughs> so no, we had a we had a great time. Thanks to Jeff, uh, thanks to Randy and and the bus driver and Sean. everybody. Sean, Sean was the bus. Driver. I mean the the whole crew the just whole crew was very welcomed nice. us in, made us feel like one of them, and it, it was it was a wonderful evening. Where where exactly did this take place? The Telus 360 in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Because he's doing all small places. Like I saw the other day, he was in a brewery. Mm-hmm. In North yeah. Carolina. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it fits the arrangement. Right. Um, yes. I mean, you know, this is a super stripped down show. It's it's two guitars and a guy beating on a washboard and a violinist who is fucking Phenomenal. amazing. He is, yeah. I, if, if you're, because they had said that, that some people seem to be shirking the idea of going because it's acoustic, you really shouldn't. I, if you no, I think like actually that'd be stuff, yeah, I mean, it's <coughs> fascinating how they've adapted some of these songs to an acoustical version and it's just beautiful and they're not they're not it's not queens right on mtv unplugged the whole time right, they're not right. sitting in, i mean they're up rocking banging right. their heads with the violinist the guitar solo and i don't believe in love oh my god yeah you know, and, and all due respect to chris degarmo and 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 you know everybody who played on the original it's a, it's a fantastic solo, but the violinist takes it and makes it his own oh yeah i mean Bow strings are are breaking. He's he's fiddling. Did you have so his fast. name? Uh Jeff told us, and I cannot remember. He's with the Cincinnati I, I Orchestra. Think he said the okay. Cincinnati. Yeah. I'm just curious. A yeah. city that begins with a C, either <laughs> Cleveland or Cincinnati. Okay. He plays with their orchestra. Oh, okay, that's cool. And now he's out on the road playing metal with Jeff Tate. Yeah, um, and and he does a phenomenal job. Like it really, it's one of those things where. I'm kind of surprised Queensryche didn't have a violin in the other songs yeah. originally because it, it fits perfectly. Well, yeah. I saw that uh, you had posted some of the songs they did, and they did uh, Lady Wore Black, which I don't think yes. Queensryche has played in I, like 30 years. Time. I mean, yeah. And it, was, I, it was awesome. Yeah, it was I mean, that's one awesome. of my favorite songs. Yeah. So. I think the last time I saw them do Lady Wore Black was uh, – Jesus was still alive. Yeah. Coop and Jesus and Robert Ford and I saw them open for – Sabbath with Dio, yeah. and uh, who else was it? Alice, Alice Cooper. Cooper. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think that was the last time. But and mm. I'll tell you, the songs like that, he still hits it. I mean, has has his voice changed? Sure, Jeff Tate's fifty eight years I old. I was gonna say, yeah, you know, he's a grandpa. Yeah, his voice has <laughs> yeah. changed. My voice has changed too. Yeah, uh, my writing style has changed, but he, the way he arranged the songs. He, he doesn't have to hit those right he raises anymore. his fits his voice his yeah. baritone is is very majestic mm-hmm. now um and yeah it just it was lady wore black was phenomenal um <laughs> mary and i they let us watch the sound check and uh they they ran through eyes of a stranger and this is just during sound check i had fucking goosebumps yeah you know yeah, it he was, did it was, it was cute to watch <laughs> so it was cute to watch mary sit in a bar across from a guy whose poster she used to have on her wall. Right. <laughs> and be cool and collected and not throw yourself at him. And, and talk about our kids and our, you know, and his grandkids. And yeah. it was, it was pretty neat. It's funny you think of the word Jeff Tate and grandkids, you know, it's just, right. <laughs> I don't world. I, it's just, you know. I mean, I could be one any day now, a grandfather. Uh, you know? uh, yeah. I mean, I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. He, you don't he, want that. He's 26, yeah. and, and and he's not attached to anyone. Yeah. And I, I like to think he's being safe, but you never know. <laughs> you never know. I'm old let's, enough I could be one. Uh, so. let's, let's hope not. You have right. enough, enough to do. Well, let's get to the, the news. Um, we don't have a lot of news this week. Um, but, you know, one, one more thing. Mary and I were talking before we started recording today. Uh, watching Jeff Tate on stage last night and then... Talking to him, you know, off the record, just in conversation, it's got me mulling over doing something for next year. Now, I know I just did a year-long tour last year, and I said, that's it. That's the last one. But 
He's pulling a kiss. But <laughs> I don't know that I've ever heard of a writer doing this. Going out on tour, eschewing bookstores of any kind, not going to any bookstore, going to clubs like the one we were in last night and coffee houses and breweries. Mm-hmm. You know, you'd have books for sale. You set up the merch table. Um, but because what Jeff Tate did, he'd, he'd, he'd introduce the song, he'd tell a story about it. And then he'd sing the song. And the next song, tell a story about it. What if I went out and did a tour where I read short stories or excerpts from novels, and I told a story about each of them before I read it? I think it'd be interesting. And, you know, I'd do it in breweries and bars, and, and you know, we got the merch table there. Probably no one would show the fuck up for that, right? I disagree. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I think... No, I think people would show up for that. I, um, I've heard You'd have to pick yeah. carefully where you went. Right. You know? Right. Um, but... I was always very big in Kentucky. Well... In Kentucky, they, they would line yeah, the you, mall. The line would go out the mall. You would know You would know places you could go and yeah. do that where it would work for you, because you've right. done enough tours. But if you pick the right areas, like you said, like Kentucky, where you get a giant right. line, uh, I think people would show up for Lima, it. Lima, Ohio. That's a joke from last night that only Mary will get. But <laughs> I'm like, I didn't even know there was such a thing. But I tried, nobody knows. Jeff Tate didn't know there was uh, either. I, I try personally not to pay attention to Ohio because uh, I still think we should sell it back to Canada. I don't. I don't see. I don't see why we have it. But um, yeah, no, I think that's a good idea. I think also some of those dates should be uh, live podcasts. Well, yeah, yeah, there, yeah. yeah, yeah, that yeah would work. I should go with you, and we could. You know, it seems. I, I, yeah. yeah, I mean, I, it, it seems. I, I, I was. See, I know you don't really want to do this, but I was going to say to you. I, I thought the other day, kind of like this. We go out on tour, not a huge tour, like a podcast tour. Yeah, we go do live shows. The horror show across yeah. America. Mark Maron has done that. Yeah, other and, people have uh, done that. Yeah. Clyde Lewis from mm-hmm. Ground Zero. He's done that with his podcast. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that would be fun. My only concern is that traveling that extensively takes a lot out of. Me, well, so. but, well, here's the thing. First of I, all, you don't do a, a ton of dates. You know, we're not Iron Maiden on the road for two right, shows right, a year. Right, right, you know? right. If you spread it out, you just, and you know, another to thing that out. occurs to me, I've been doing it wrong. Okay, now <laughs> touring, you're doing it wrong. The, the people I had with me on tour were fantastic. You know, country singer Casey Lansdale. She's delightful. She's my bud. She's, she's my my left hand. She's my left hand. You're my right hand. Casey's my left hand. <laughs> Look the fuck out, Dave. You know, Dave was along. Todd Clark. You know, who, uh, the biggest motherfucking bouncer you'll ever meet. <laughs> He's but, pretty badass. Yeah. But for the majority of the tour, we were doing this out of my Jeep Wrangler. Right. Yeah. I have, last night, in studying the, the procession you Jeff Tatis put the, I want a bus. That's what I'm going for. <laughs> I want you to let me buy an RV. Or we're back to the RV for again. for the purposes of this See, tour. See, this this is but you know, you're getting yourself into trouble here because you'll get the RV and then stuff will happen to it. And it's yours. You, you don't want to. It'll do be this. like the ATM. Yeah. You'll start off. It, now you don't want you don't want to be stories. responsible. See, they don't own those buses; they rent them. <laughs> All right, so we'll rent an RV. Yeah. Okay. Well, you see how much that. Costs. And we'll get Sean to drive for us. Jeff takes <laughs> driver. He was a nice guy. He was a nice guy. He's probably he looking a for nice a gig guy. after this. And he doesn't pull off and sleep on the side of the yeah, road. Yeah. <laughs> so. No, I think it would be good. I mean, a lot of readers tell me that one of their favorite parts of a short story collection are the parts like either in the front or the back where the writer talks about the inspiration for the story. Now, honestly, I'll tell you the truth. And it, it's not an opinion. It, it's honestly like it, it, it dumbfounded me. I didn't think that readers cared where stories came oh, from, but apparently yeah. oh, no, they do. They don't, no, no, they no. really the do. The first no. thing, anytime Stephen King or Brian Hodge or Joe Lansdale or Michael Marshall Smith releases a collection, they always have the those, first yeah. thing I do before I even read the stories, I go to the story notes and read those. I'm fascinated, especially by their story notes, because all, all four of them are very good <laughs> with story notes. Um, well, I guess if you had if you had interesting stories about the stories, I think, it, I think <laughs> I people think would sounds... like it. <laughs> No, we, I, and we could do a whole whole ensemble. Like we get Casey, and you know she plays some music, open open up, you know, warm up the crowd, and then uh, and then you know Mary, you come out, tell a story, read a story, and then and then you know Dave and I come out, and, and we we do a Q and A with the audience, and and then maybe I tell a story, read a story. Mm-hmm. I mean this. I think it'd be fun. 
fun. No, I, th- I, I that idea you just what you just laid out right there would be perfect, and you do it in small places like brewery, right. brew pubs and, right. and things like that. Mm-hmm. You don't do bookstores. Not that bookstores are going to exist in another year, but you know that's a, that's a whole other story. No, now we we would not be able to take Dungeon Master. No, um, no. Coop would not be able to join no. us because no. I mean he's a medic. And yeah, he's he works too much. People yeah. would be dying while yeah. he's out on the road <laughs> yes. with us. That that would yeah that would be well. bad. Um, career aspirations that would really. be bad. But Lombardo could Lombardo possibly. Well, I was going to say. Uh, you know, merchandise seller Lombardo would. <laughs> so yes. we have Lombardo yes. around the merch table. Yes. All right. Oh yeah. Yes. Oh yeah. And we'll have him come up on stage and say something. Um, you know, I think be Lombardo. before the authorities get there. Yeah. You know. We should let Lombardo tell a story. <laughs> yes. <laughs> every every stop, Lombardo should tell some well, story. Well, he's got tons of stories about making movies. They're yeah. fascinating. So you know that would certainly. That would add add to the thing. Absolutely. Yeah, Phoebe could not do this because no. of her work schedule. Yeah. It's impossible. Although if we do this, we do have to do some sort of local show. When I say local, right. like here or right. Maryland, somewhere in this area, that on a weekend that she could do that because she would. She's. I'm still trying to find a venue for uh, this thing Paul Camping and I want to do. Right. And yeah. I'll tell you, looking at the Telus 360 tonight, I think it would suit our yeah, needs. Yeah, we were talking yeah. about that last yeah. night, actually. Yeah. The problem I'm running into is is either the venue is too big, yeah, and it's going to look like we didn't sell it out, right? Or it's too small and mm-hmm. people aren't going to be able to get in, yeah. Um, and I know Paul's getting frustrated with me, and and, and people who want to see the film in that setting are getting mm-hmm. frustrated with me, but just patience, yeah, okay, <laughs> patience, exactly. Patience. No, the, the people don't understand. You know, we're sitting and we're just throwing these ideas out, but then the logistics of setting this up. Yeah, it's right. not like it's not going to happen overnight. Anybody's like, "Oh my God, can I buy tickets now?" Calm yourself down right now because <laughs> it's, hold it's, your water. Yeah, hold exactly. It's it's we'd have to get this set up. I mean, I really want to do this. I think I think fun. it's a great and, idea. All right, you know what? Fuck yeah. it, we're gonna do it. Yeah. And there's places in New Jersey. There's places in New York City too. Don't I, forget. Well, we I, go up. I, my I, parents I, will feed us on our way up. I there, don't know so. that I can park an RV in your parents' driveway, babe. <laughs> If you parked it in front of the house, if I'm we sure hire, we'd end up with my brother-in-law, we hire maybe Sean, my dad. If we hire Sean, the bus driver, I'll have to email Jeff Tate's people and get Sean's contact. <laughs> info, I, I kind of feel like I we want Sean. We need Sean. to have Sean to drive yeah. us around. Yeah. 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 We right. have to let the man sleep, though. <laughs> All right. All right. Let's get to the news. Um, Bubba Hotep. <gasps> I love Bubba Hotep. Everybody loves Bubba Who Hotep. Love Bubba the Hotep? classic horror Bizarro short story by Joe R. Lansdale. It's delightful. Which, of course, was turned into a, a, a cult classic film directed by Don Coscarelli, starring Bruce Campbell and Ossie Davis. Which is also delightful. In which retired secret government <laughs> agent Elvis Presley <laughs> and John F. Kennedy, who did not die in Dallas, are in an old folks' home fighting a mummy. Yes. Could it ever get any better than that, Dave? Uh, I'm going to say yes, because I'm assuming there's something going on here. So yes. I'll say yes. <laughs> Subterranean Press and Joe R. Lansdale have announced a novel-length prequel Oh wow! to Bubba Hotep called really? Bubba and the Cosmic Bloodsuckers. <laughs> now, I've known about this for a Yay! while, and I had to keep my mouth shut. It was one of those things that, you know those times when I'm bouncing up and down on my hands and you look at me and you go, what? And I go, nothing. Yes. This was one of those nothings. Um, yeah. Um, Bubba and the Cosmic Bloodsuckers, uh, it revisits Elvis Presley's years working for a secret government organization. <laughs> uh, this time, Elvis is part of a team tasked with stopping an invasion of hive-minded, shape-shifting, vampire-like creatures. That is awesome. Who apparently have... Started their base in a junkyard in New Orleans. Of course. Um, where else would you go, really? In addition to Elvis, this novel features uh, real-life figures such as Colonel Parker, who was Elvis's notorious manager. Uh, <laughs> for the millennials out there, Google Colonel Parker in, in relation to Elvis and read up on him. Uh, Richard M. Nixon, <laughs> fresh from his stint in The Damned Highway by Nick Mamatas yeah. and myself. Nice. And John Henry of Railroad fame. So they're all teaming up with Elvis. Um, the book is up for order right now from Subterranean Press. 1,500 copies, limited edition, hardcover, 40 bucks. When was the last time you were able to get a limited yeah, edition right? hardcover for 40 bucks? Yeah. Um, so very, very excited about that. Um, in other news this week, I have finalized all the authors 
for this year's Scares the Care Charity Convention taking place in August. Nice. Or excuse me, July, July. Yeah. once again in Williamsburg, Virginia. Um, and I would like to announce them. They're not even all on the website yet. Okay. So are you ready? Drum roll, please. It's sort of breaking news, really. Yeah. Making his first appearance at Scares the Cares Charity Weekend is Mr. John Skip. Woohoo! Making a return appearance is Mr. Joe R. Lansdale, who we Woo-hoo! just got done talking about. Uh, I'm un- just gonna just gonna it's a a, a pre woo-hoo. a pre woohoo for everybody. Are so you gonna to, are you no. gonna be like that woman in the no. crowd last night? No, no. Oh my god. Oh. So she was a banshee. So there's this woman in the front row, and you could tell she was even working on the band members. Jeff Tate's up there trying to tell fucking meaningful, heartfelt stories, mm-hmm. sometimes funny, about these songs. And this woman is in the front fucking row going, Wee! Wee! like an air raid siren, like uh, the neighbor's oh dog. Uh, she's, that she's is the word. I, I, I've said this before. I don't understand why the people can't shut the fuck up when they're out in public. Well, I wanted to go up to her afterward. Mary wouldn't let me. Yeah. I wanted to go up and just kind of touch her shoulder and yeah. say, hey, I really enjoyed your performance. Yeah, I, I, yeah. You know, <laughs> um, I, I, the two things I don't get are people that cannot shut their fucking mouths. And this is the movies. It's at shows. It's it why I like metal shows. They're yammering. You can't hear them. You know? <laughs> so the other thing that pisses me the fuck off is people that have to be on their goddamn phones at a show. Yeah. Put your fucking phone away. It's dark. Your stupid phone light. Yeah. Yeah. We went to see Yes uh, a couple years ago um, up in the uh, Allentown. There's a casino up there now. Right. And at the old steel mill. And, you know, it's Yes, so it's an older crowd, so it's a seated show. Right. You know? So we're all sitting there. And it was a show where they did uh, three or four albums. It was Close to the Edge, uh, Fragile, and uh, the Yes album. Right. So that's, you know, that was the show. And it was an amazing show. But this woman in front of us, who obviously was drugged there by her husband, <laughs> um, at, at one point gets her phone and starts playing uh, Angry Birds. <laughs> oh, my God. And Phoebe and I are just, you know, we're looking at each other and we're looking at this woman and she's like, do, 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 do. And then she's on Facebook. And I just wanted to smack the phone out of her hand. It's like <laughs> the, you're witnessing one of the greatest rock bands in the history of rock and roll. You know, these guys are in their 60s, 70s right. old. They're still kicking total ass. And this is when Chris Grier was still alive. You know, right. so he, you know, he's playing with him and it's just like, you're out for the night. It's live music. Okay. You might not be that necessarily doing music, but you could just have a good time. Put your fucking right, phone right. away. Just you don't need it. to be on Facebook 24 seven. Right. You know, just trust me, your idiot friends will be talking about stupid shit. When you go home, you'll still be able to catch up on it. Yeah. You know, right, just, right. This makes me nuts. It's like, people can't like experience anything. No, it's like, I agree. You know, and I've gone to shows where I'm like not necessarily into the band, but it's live music. It's still like entertaining. Right. You know, I'm not like a, like I'm not a theater person at all, you know, yeah. but I've been to show like plays. In fact, right. when, I, when I used to live in, in LA, somebody I knew was like a, a rep for one of the actors unions. So I would go with them to plays because they'd go to like you know meet actors and represent them. And they always had free tickets. So I'm like, oh, okay, free entertainment. Right. And okay, I'm not into like Phantom of the Opera. That's not my thing. But I went and it was like, right. okay, it was an evening out and it was all right. And it's something it was, different. It's something do. different. You know, it's just like have an experience, have a new experience. You never know, you might like it. I don't know. You know, it's but just, people it's have just, no manners. No, anymore it's either. just they're I mean, so rude. But when, the fucking when hoot and doing hollers, something. Because we saw um, at Prog Power one year, John Oliva from Sabotage uh, was doing an acoustic show. Right. Because Mary spits all over herself. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, are, having... are you a closet sabotage fan, baby? No, no I, I was having a tea issue. She has okay. a drinking problem. <laughs> I have a drinking problem, yeah. So, but he's doing an acoustic show, and he's trying to tell stories, you know, between the songs about, you know, how he wrote them and stuff. And, he, and a lot of times, in, whenever he does a show, he talks about his brother, Chris Oliva, who was a member of Sabotage, until he was killed by a drunk driver. Right. You know, and he obviously is still, you know, to this day, very affected by this. Right. And it affects his music. So he's telling these emotional stories about his brother and how he wrote songs. And the fucking people in the back room are just... Yeah. It's like, shut the fuck up. Why can't you go outside? Why do you pay money for a ticket to a show? Right. And then stand there and yammer the whole time. And then people are like, you know, on the message board later, people are like, why can't people, well, we don't see each other but once a year. Go the fuck outside. You right. don't need to be in a fucking acoustic show. This crap pisses me yeah, off. Yeah, or it's go just, out to dinner. Don't yeah, go to a concert. Yeah, go yeah, to some place where yeah, you can talk. It's like, that's what they were doing last night, and it was maddening. My other thing was that Mary wouldn't yeah. let me fuck with any. I know, that's disappointing. Mary, know, you're the I no know. fun girl. I mean, even Kelly Gray, guitarist yeah. Kelly Gray, who, yeah. who's actually running the soundboard right. for this tour, right. even he was getting pissed at the people yeah. behind us. I let you and try to trip that one girl. You did. And, <laughs> okay. I, and I was going to hold my tongue when you wanted to push that drum 
drunk guy down the stairs. I could have gotten away with it. Too. I know. I was gonna let you fuck with people. I just yeah. It's I I, I love live music. I love going to shows, but like the, a lot of times the crowd is just such a huge turn off. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the other thing I can't say is the dude bros have to be punching each other the whole time. Uh, yeah. <laughs> there was none of that. Last well, there wouldn't be an acoustic. Show, typically not an acoustic show. But I remember last time I saw Volbeat. I just like I'm never going to see Volbeat again. I love Volbeat. Yeah, the they're good. crowd like is so irritating at a Volbeat show now. Yeah, you know, and all the dude bros discovered them. You know, woohoo! Punch, punch, punch. Because like, I was at one night, and there was like five or six of them. They were in front of me. They just kept hitting each other. And I'm like, if one of you touches me, I don't care that there's six of you. I'm killing all of you. Yeah. Just, yeah. you're all going down. It's just like calm the fuck down. Yeah. You know? I always think I miss going to to concerts and shows and bars and stuff until I'm actually at. Concerts and shows and bars, and I see exactly, the general yeah. public out, out with out with the you filth. Know. Coop, I like and, to say. I, Coop yeah. and I went to see Sick of It All and Hate Breed and Biohazard a yeah. few years ago, and uh, we got in the pit as you do. I mean, right. well, it's, it's, that it's show, Sick of It All, yeah. Biohazard, yeah. Hate Breed. You're gonna get in the pit, um, yeah. And I realized after the first song, I'm too old for the fucking pit. Because these kids don't know what the fuck they're doing. No, no. You know, they're they're legitimately out to break people. Oh, homes. yeah, no, right. you, no. It's it's, yeah. it's yeah. so different from when we... I know this sounds like the old man talking about walking no, 20 miles to yeah. school each way. It's so different it's from different. when we were, like, in our 20s. Yeah. Uh-huh. Where if someone fell down, the whole pit would the stop whole, yeah. until they and made sure that up. person yeah. was now okay. They now they will the just person. stomp on it. Yeah, yeah, it's ridiculous. It's about breaking bones and... yeah, Which, it's, which like, I don't know, yeah. to me, kind of defeats the purpose of, like... It's, it's activity, it's you know. Jackassery is, is the worst sort. Yeah. Well, should we get back to scarcity care? Sure. <laughs> All right. All <laughs> right. There wasn't a lot of news. So if you're if you're a new to... listener, this happens every week. <laughs> uh. <laughs> what would you rather listen to? A show like this where people are having a conversation about interesting things, or a show where some guy just reads the news and then goes on to the next news story? I'm going to go with the first one. A show We're like this. Fun. Yes. Thank you. Fun. Damn yes. it. And based on our our listening numbers, I think people agree. Yes. So all right. Yeah, sorry, so... it's not three guys with beards. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, but you, you can tell it's not through guys' because you can actually hear us talk. So it doesn't sound like we're recording a barrel. So just, yeah, yeah. You know, I wish Kelly Owen would start recording her podcast again. We haven't been able to make fun of her because she's been on hiatus. So, Kelly. I this, think she's coming back. This is a personal plea. <laughs> we bring, need material. Bring man. back the buttercup, Kelly. <laughs> That should be a new slogan. Bring back the buttercup. Bring back the buttercup. <laughs> All right. So John Skip, Joe Lansdale, Chet Williamson, another first appearance. That's the first time for him. Yeah. Yep. yeah. And Paul Tremblay. Oh. Woo-hoo! Uh, probably our most requested guest. He loves pickles. Yes. <laughs> He when loves you, when you get your book signed by yeah. Paul, bring yeah. in pickles. Yes. yes. Um, actually, I'm going to be taking Paul to a shooting range while we're down there. He's working on a novel right now that involves a lot of gunplay. Paul is not a gun owner. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've been answering questions for him. And he mentioned, he said, you know, I, I guess I really should shoot one at some point before I turn this novel in. <laughs> and I said, well, fuck, you know, while we're in Virginia together, I'll, I'll rent some time at a range. So that's going to be fun. Um, Wrath James White return appearance. Mm-hmm. Nice. Damien Angelica Walters. First nice. time. Her first time. Uh, Jonathan Jans return appearance. I, at this point, now, what I had tried to do was clear out the celebrity room of authors that have been there repeatedly. For example, Mary. Right. You've been at Three Scares That Cares. Mm-hmm. Um, you'll be there again this year. I will. You're not in the celebrity room. That's you're in the right. vendor room with your own table. Mm-hmm. Um, but... When it comes to Jans, I can't do that because I, I think the attendees would riot. Uh, <laughs> nice, too popular. Yeah. yeah. So, so Jans is in there. Uh, Ronald Malfi and Armand Rosamilia, returning guests. Brian Smith, returning guest. Nice. Edward Lee, returning guest. Tom Monteleone and John McClay, who not only are going to be signing, but they're going to be holding a writer's workshop. More on that. Yes. Will be announced. And Rachel Autumn Deering. Very cool. So, the biggest author lineup we've had at Scares the Care. Mm-hmm. Um, I was allowed to bring in a few more people. There may, may, may be one more person. Um, if you're looking at that and you're saying, well, John Skip, Joe Lansdale, that, that almost seems like Splatterpunk, Brian. <laughs> yes. And there's one more person um, who, if his schedule permits, I may like to bring in. Um, and if his schedule doesn't permit, that's cool, you know, and I'll bring him next year. Um, but yeah, John Skip, 
Skip, Lansdale, Williamson, Tremblay, White, Walters, Jans, Malfi, Rosamilia, Smith, Lee, Monteleone, McClay, and Deering. Pretty awesome. That's a good lineup. For more on the convention and the charity and to see the movie guests, I didn't even mention like the Friday the 13th reunion <laughs> or any of that. I, I just mentioned the authors. Go to scaresthecareweekend.com. So, Dave, before we get to Jeff Tate, you had mentioned to me that, you know, early on in the podcast, mm-hmm. every week we used to talk about what we're reading, and the listeners really seemed to like that right, and respond to that. And kind we, of got away from that. Yeah, and, and you wanted to get back to that. Yes. So, uh, Let's do that. This week, I am reading Death Stalks the Night by Hugh B. Cave. Now, uh, younger listeners, I'm sure, don't know who Hugh Cave was. Right. He's one of the pulp writers back in the 30s, writing for Weird mm. Tales and all the, the pulp magazines. Um, the edition I have here is Faye Dogan and Bremer's wonderful hardcover. Uh, the book has been re-released, I think, by Wildside in paperback and Kindle. I know it's available on Amazon. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Death Stalks the Night... Basically, it's a genre we don't hear much about anymore called Weird Menace, which was a very particular type of pulp that blended horror stories with detective stories. So you have the two-fisted detective, Mm -hmm. and, you know, instead of fighting, uh, you know, killers, he's fighting a vampire or a werewolf or things like that. Um, it's I had forgotten how much fun these stories are. They <laughs> they are very much of their time with some of the language. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm sure some of it would be seen as problematic by our younger listeners, but that uh, so is anything written right, or made right. in that era. If you think um, of it as being like you said, a reflection of the society and the time period in which it was written. Yeah, look at it as a historical artifact, which it right. is. Um, but the stories are so much goddamn fun, and I had forgotten just how ruthless and brutal Hugh Cave was back and now we talked last on last week's show the Robert Block show we mm-hmm. talked about you know he was you can you can draw a line from splatterpunk and extreme horror to Robert Block the same can be said of Hugh Cave um so that's what I'm reading and that's what I recommend Mary how about you what, what did you just finish reading I just finished because I'm since my son has gone off to college in a far far away place uh, I've been doing a lot of commuting. And also, I think anyone that, that knows, Brian and I currently live about three hours apart. So for me to come see him, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's a good six hours round trip in the car. Uh, and I've taken to reading, a lot, or to reading, I call it reading, but to me it is kind of reading because I have to pay attention. Uh, audiobooks. Audiobooks, for, especially from iTunes, have been kind of a godsend. So I've been catching up on some of my reading that way. And so, incidentally, anyone who wants to to donate presents as opposed to money to me, uh, you can get me iTunes gift cards. And I just finished Creatures of the Pool by Ramsey Campbell. Um, oh. Yeah. I, I love Ramsey's stuff. I really do. It it has a subtlety to it that I, I find just absolutely masterful. And I do kind of like fangirl on Ramsey, and, and it's, I, you know, and he handles it in a very gracious way. <laughs> But I do. I kind of fangirl on him. And um, I just finished that, and I thought it was wonderful. Uh, I wish that there were more of his books in audiobook. He has a lot of, uh, like, Kindle versions of things. He's got a lot of, you know, ebook kind of things, but not a lot of his stuff is audiobooks. And one, one of the things that I find absolutely criminal is that there is no Carl Edward Wagner on audiobook at all. No? No. I don't know who's in charge of his estate. Is any of his stuff even in print anymore at this point? Yes. Um, you can get some of his books on Amazon, but you can't. There's no audio books. Centipede has some stuff in stock, actually, Centipede Press. Mm-hmm. Um, some of the Kane novels and stuff are, are. I mean, they did these really beautiful limited editions. Right, yeah. But they still have them in stock. Um, I, I actually have been looking into the estate kind of quietly. Um, simply for a, a project that I'd, I'd like to do. As you guys know, Carl Edward Wagner, huge influence Huge influence, on me. yeah. Um, and it, it's it's hard to determine who's in charge and what's going on. I, I know at oh, one point it was David Drake. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I believe his wife was involved at one point, but I, I'm not, there's not a lot of information out there. No, no. So. I, whoever is in charge, if you're listening, I really think that you're... 
you're missing a, a huge market of people who would really enjoy his stuff if you, if you you know were, could get it back out there, especially in audiobooks. I was delighted to find that Kathy's getting a lot of Charlie Grant stuff in audiobooks now. Yeah. Um, through Crossroads, I think. Through Crossroads actually. Press, yeah, my Crossroads. audiobook publisher. Yeah, uh, which I think is awesome. Uh, so some of these classics are coming back, but yeah, I really find it's it's just such a disservice not to have Carl Edgar Wagner stuff on audiobook. Isn't there a setting now? I don't know a whole lot about this, but isn't there some sort of setting or something with the Kindle like app that it will read or things read out it loud? To you. Yes, yeah, yes. But, it's a, it's a but robot. not all of them. But yeah. Well, yeah, I know that. And, and it is reading it like this. <laughs> Hello, Dave. Does it really? I mean, is it uh, like I, I've never done I am Osimo 5000. <laughs> <laughs> wow, the Osimo 5000 is among the most amazing things ever. Um, <laughs> But I, I I thought it did that. I can't listen to audiobooks. I I've said that before. I'll zone right out if I'm driving. It depends on the yeah, readers. I just, I, you really have to have a phenomenal. Reader. I have to have loud ass music on to drive, so uh, I can't do that. Phoebe loves audiobooks. I, yeah, I do. And I just any know. podcast that's like the story type podcast, mm-hmm. she listens to something now called Loom. I think it is or something like that. She was talking about that the other day. It's, it's apparently been made into a TV show. I'm like. Where's our TV deal? You know? I know, right? Right. You know what I? Know? You know what else I think is is you Keep know that here. reaching. Oh, I some... just didn't want it vibrating the table. I'm sorry, Mary. We 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 didn't mean to distract you. <laughs> you with your vibrating but things. That that was vibrating next to the the equipment. And it's the fine. thing was vibrating thing. next to the. The thing. person that never turns his phone off is complaining about my phone. I find that interesting. <laughs> I wasn't complaining about your phone. You just grabbed it and took the it. The last time it vibrated on the table, I got an uh, email from David Scow. I think it was David Scow. Maybe even Brian Hodge, I can't remember. Somebody said we could hear it vibrating. So <laughs> And you know so what I say to that? Those of you with money <laughs> can freely send it to us so we can have a nice studio. Um <laughs> I'm building a nice studio. No, but we could you know, you could use some cash. I could build it faster if yeah, I had more cash. Exactly. That's work, true. Yes. work has yes. stopped until my next royalty yeah. check. So, you know, if you don't want to hear vibrating phones or the guy mowing the lawn, although I think we're still gonna hear the guy mowing the lawn. He's probably just gonna park his will, yeah. he's just gonna park his mower outside the window and just let it sit there for an hour. Uh, you know. Cough up some cash. I, I always, love these, things always, always love these, you know, armchair producers. You know, <laughs> that, that you know know how to do do a show, and they're not here. You um, set them off like do it's, I like come it's to your house and tell you how to write? Thing. No, I do not. And trust me, there's some people out there I should go to their house and tell them how to write because they suck. <laughs> Some of the crap. Why don't you just take them food shopping? Why don't you? Oh, yeah. You talking about that? You said you said before. You said weird menace. I'm like, isn't that what I say at the grocery store every time? <laughs> I have to go to the grocery store today. I'm not happy about it. What have you been reading, Dave? Uh, <laughs> I'm reading a book about how to be nice to people, and it's it's not working. How to win friends and influence yeah, people. I fucking hate humans, especially people that bitch about stuff they don't know anything about. You're doing it wrong. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, I'll remember this. <laughs> I'm reading a book called The Grace of Kings by, and I, I, here's me always mispronouncing names, and I apologize. I think it's Ken, it's L I U, I think it's Liu. I don't Okay, I believe sure. that's how I think it's, I think it's, yeah. it, it's basically, uh, it was described to me as Asian Game of Thrones. Oh. Which. Sort of so far, I, I'm you know I'm currently you know reading it so but but it's really good. Nice. It's you know it's a fantasy novel and it's you know kingdoms warring against each other and people doing terrible things to each other. It's my favorite kind of book. So um, I'm about a third way into it. It's you know it's like a doorstop. I think it's like 800 pages or something. Like that. It's huge. Wow. Uh, it's one of those books that you know, I could drop on my foot and hurt myself. Um, so uh, it's really good. I think it's a plan to be a trilogy. I think the second book is out. This is the first one. But I'm not positive about that. But uh, then again, Game of Thrones is planned to be a trilogy. And we all saw how that worked out. So, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I don't know. But I'm really enjoying this a lot. Um, so that's what I read. And I also, because I always read m- multiple books at a time. I have this book, this new book by this person uh, named Mary San Giovanni. <laughs> that, uh, that I started to read. I haven't read enough of it yet to make a comment on it. So, um, What is the name of that again? Because I'm oh, terrible at titles. Oh, that book. Yeah, yeah. that one. <laughs> Chills? Yes, that. yes, that one. Yeah, I heard that's right. It's a passable, yeah. it's a passable weird menace. And I got right? the uh, new Tim Levin book in the mail. Yes, yeah. I know Amazon delivers stuff on Sundays now, which is really weird. 
Yes. By drone? Yes. N- no, Are by like drone? crazy person who throws things at your front porch. <laughs> wow. Because that's what happens in my house. I always say, I think the UPS driver in my neighborhood slows down to about 20 when he heaves boxes at my house. Because I always hear ka-chunk. <laughs> so like, oh, I'm not wearing like rare glassware right, or anything. Right, right. Yeah. Not so, getting anything from yeah, the, one. The, the, the new Tim Levin book came yesterday. So, nice. Uh, I, I will be reading that because I generally enjoy anything he's written. So uh, I think it's called Relics, I think is the new one. I just ordered uh, the new Lansdale that we talked about earlier. Yeah, I'm going to order that because you said 40 bucks. That's actually yeah. a good deal. Mm, um, that is a good deal. You know, know, hey, here's something that we can talk about. A, a horror show exclusive. <laughs> and it, it involves one of our co-hosts. Oh? It, it involves you. I think. Oh. <laughs> you, you, si- you signed the contract, right? So we can talk. Mary, well, Dave. I, to, which one? The is comic. That... The comic oh, yes, book. yes, yes. Mary is going to be writing a Wonder Woman. Oh, uh, that's right. That's right. My very first comic ever. And so, it's a Wonder Woman unlike anything oh, yeah. you've seen before. I'm just going to mess with your heads. And you're working with uh, with Keith Giffen. I he, am. He, he's helping you plot it out. I was telling you know? somebody the other day, I said, because like I said, I'm, I'm, this is my first foray, foray into comics, and I don't know a whole lot about the comic business, but I was telling a comic book fan um, that I got this, this deal and he kind of sat dumbfounded for a minute. I said, yeah. And I'm working with this guy, Keith, Keith Giffen. Do you know him? And right away he goes, I'm already drooling. <laughs> Keith has that effect on people. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. Well, if we don't have anything else, let's, uh, let's get to the meat of this week's episode, our interview with Jeff Tate. Okay. Before we do that, I do want to mention, first of all, because I forgot to, at the beginning of the show, Mary's tea is brought to you by White Castle. The tea she is drinking right now is from White Castle. The Crave is a powerful thing. Feed your crave at any available White Castle near you. The tea is actually from White Castle? Well, the tea in her mug. And actually, I kind of want a White Castle hamburger now. Well, uh, you know, our (laughs) marketing department at White Castle, uh, (laughs) you've just about run out of of ad spots for all the swag that you sent us. So if you want to overnight marry some freeze-dried hamburgers or something, yeah. So uh, the, the sack. This week's show is also brought to you by Husk by Rachel Autumn Deering, which is available right now in paperback and Kindle. Phenomenal phenomenal debut novel uh if you're into the work of jack ketchum um is it brutal it, oh it's but it's psychologically brutal it's not okay. like it's not like me or brian smith or or, or richard layman or wrath you know it, it's 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 much more along the lines of ketchum it's it's yeah. just psychologically brutal it sounds really good yeah so uh let's go to jeff tate now a reminder uh this was recorded in a bar Mm-hmm. With very high ceilings and ventilation over us, and ceiling fans, you know, roadies coming in, um, and and not to mention Jeff, <laughs> he's a very quiet speaker. Yeah, he is. Um, so, you know, he's saving his voice to go on stage. So, but but Dave is gonna punch up the audio a little bit. However, if you're having trouble listening to the interview, here's what I want you to do. Okay, I, I want you to to look at your computer or your phone, or whatever device you're listening to this on your television, and I want you to turn up the volume, <laughs> okay? In- instead of emailing us and say, well, I-, I could hear the show great until the interview. And did you Turn it up. Yeah, did you adjust your volume? Oh, no, I didn't think, I didn't think of that. Huh. Oh, a volume? What's <laughs> that, Brian? Huh? <laughs> oh, humans. So, all right. Let's go to Jeff Tate, and then we'll come back. All right, Mary, we are here at the TELUS 360 in Lancaster with uh, none other than multi-platinum selling, Grammy-nominated singer, musician, and actor, Jeff Tate, who, of course, rose to prominence as the former lead singer of Queens, right? One of the biggest progressive metal bands of all time, and also, as regular listeners know, my favorite fucking band of all time. This is Um, true. Jeff has also had a notable solo career with releases such as Kings and Thieves and the eponymous Jeff Tate. For decades, he's been consistently ranked and honored as one of the best metal vocalists of all time by Hit Parader, That Metal Show, Rolling Stone, Vegas Rocks, OC Weekly, many more. Um, He recently put his skills as a legendary frontman to work in front of the camera, playing a sadistic killer in the found footage slasher film The Burning More Deaths, which is available right now on DVD and Amazon Prime. 
He's currently crossing the country for the Whole Story Acoustic Tour. Jeff, welcome to the show. It's an honor. Thank you. Uh, I, I gotta tell you, now, I've sat in a green room and talked comic books with Alice Cooper. I've given Bruce Campbell advice on planning a book signing tour. Stephen King gave me a, a wonderful, unexpected blurb. But I think this might be the first time I'm restraining myself from going full fanboy on somebody. <laughs> so if I leap across and hug you, I apologize. <laughs> Um, I'm, I I'm used to that. I'm used to that. You're used to that? <laughs> okay. Mary, you can fill in. You can jump across I, and hug him and sure. be a little better. Absolutely. All right. All right. Um, so this tour is sort of the story of your life. It's, it's songs you wrote throughout different stages of your life. How long did it take you to select the, the, the set list? I mean, were there songs that you're like, oh, yeah, I don't want to revisit that? Or? Um, it, it, uh, it actually came together very quickly. Uh, I, I kind of knew instinctively what I wanted to play and then it was down to getting the band to play it and seeing how they how they did with right it, you know there was a few songs that I wanted to do that we we ended up not being able to do because it just didn't work <clears throat> and you never really know um, how a song is going to work until you start playing it you know right and you might be able to put it together with a really nice uh, you know arrangement in the rehearsal studio but then when you pull it out live and play it it just doesn't seem to you know connect with right. people uh, which is somewhat of a disappointment but uh, you learn to deal with it and swallow your pride and move on you know? <laughs> and luckily I can pick another song <laughs> I got a lot of them <laughs> no, now we were we were talking in the bar earlier uh, we found out we have the same work ethic I write every day you write every day mm -hmm. um, you're writing while on tour though I mean how do you, do you feel like you're getting a lot accomplished writing on a tour bus? I mean, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it, I write on headphones. Yeah, you know, so so you just drown out the rest of the yeah. rest of the crew, all the drama. You you're unaware. You're just sitting there writing every day. Well, I'm kind of aware, but uh, I, I kind of really get into what I do a right. lot. Um, I'm kind of a, like a junkie in that respect. You know, I'm really addictive to the the, the creative. Um, atmosphere i like to be in a creative atmosphere at, at all times if i can help it i hear you i'm Absolutely. somewhat i'm somewhat dismayed and disappointed if i'm not right. <laughs> in a creative <laughs> environment you know yeah so um that i find headphones really help uh, kind of cut you off from what's going on on the outside so right. that way you can kind of focus what's going on, on the inside so what what you're I think uh, from here in Lancaster, I think you guys travel to Canada next. So mm -hmm. will you just be doing rough ideas, or are you doing like keyboard work? Yeah, I, both. Yeah, both yeah, while you're yeah. traveling. Yeah. Wow. I do editing. I do uh, um, composition, um, lyric writing, just everything. Yeah. You know? How much has that changed since? I guess you know, I'm a longtime Queensrÿche fan. I mean, the legend is 1981. You guys are putting together a demo tape and. They have one song without lyrics, The Lady Wore Black, mm -hmm. and they ask you to write the lyrics. Has your process changed from then to now? I mean, mm. or is it still at its core? The well, I, I actually learned, um, we talked about writing every day. I, I didn't used to write every day. Um, I started that um, probably around the time of uh, maybe uh, Empire, yeah. I think. And uh, that's where I really got into the, the discipline of it, you know. Before right. that, I was just kind of writing when the mood, you know, took me, right. you know, or if I had to get something done. But uh, around then is when I really got into the discipline of it and uh, working a full day, you know, at it and then putting it away for the night and coming back the next day and having a jumping off point. Right. You know, I think uh, Julie Cameron was her name. She wrote this uh, book called The Artist's Way, which I found to be... Uh, really inspirational where she said it really helps to leave something undone each day that yes. way you have some place to start that, on yes. the next day you know and so I've mm -hmm. kind of taken that uh, that concept same method working. I use I, I I end literally in the middle of a sentence yeah. every day yeah. and then pick it up you know it's a great jump, jumping off point a great process you know to uh, start from a song like uh, take a bullet off Kings and Thieves or Jet City Woman I mean as a as a fan I'm assuming these are deeply personal songs for you, just based on the lyrics. Uh, it feels to me like you, you bled a bit of yourself into those lyrics. Um, is the process for writing something like that harder than it is for something lighter like, I don't know, like Last Time in Paris, something like that? Um, I mean, does it take you longer when, it, when it's really personal like that? 
Oh, uh, gosh. I, I, I don't think so. No? No. It, it, I'm trying to think of the, the, those instances that you cited there. Uh, last time in Paris was a situational um, uh, event. You yeah. Know, that just happened, and so I just <laughs> wrote, it, <laughs> I wrote it down, and I didn't actually put that uh, lyric to music for like a year later yeah. you know but like last time in paris it's it's lighthearted it's fun mm-hmm. take a bullet i mean you know as somebody who would do anything for his friends and and has had those friends turn on him once in a while i mean that, that song strikes a chord with me as, as something mm. much more personal you know? yeah yeah I, I suppose it is but getting in touch with how you feel about things is part of the exercise of writing i think as, as you know oh, yeah. um you know you it's hard, I think, and, and difficult uh, sometimes to access that part of yourself and, and let that out, you know. But once you're in there and you're, and you're, you're you've, you've cut yourself open, you know, you might as well bleed on the page right, exactly. <laughs> since you got to bleed anyway, right? <laughs> <laughs> Some of the, the tougher things for me to write have been, uh, say. Um, Sweet Sister Mary from op- the first Operation Mind Crime was a real tough one to write. Really? Oh. Yeah. As I, I, I wanted to write from Mary's perspective and uh, try to capture a, um, a, 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 the, the female point of view. Right. Which is, I find, very difficult to do. Um, now, I find that interesting because you, you, you are a father of four daughters. Correct? Five. Five, Five daughters. daughters. Yeah. And, and, and at what? least one grand? I have five grandkids. Wow. Yeah. And and yet you struggle with finding the, the female voice. I do. Voice. Yeah. I'm yeah. pretty uh, masculine. <laughs> <laughs> I started to say that, then I thought, should I say that? <laughs> you know, it's funny, we were talking about that song and that, the whole album on the way down. And can I tell them the story? Yeah, when go ahead. Tell them the story. Because you know, my name is Mary. So when I was in high school, friends would pull up to me in the parking lot, and I'd hear the power window go down, and they'd go, Kill her. That's all you have to do. <laughs> Kill Mary. She's a risk. And get the priest as well. And I thought, how awesome. <laughs> I'm glad you'd look at it that way rather than uh, oh, it's the opposite. It's yeah. you know, Speaking of mind crime, I, it's hard for me to believe, I guess it is for you, that album turns 30 years old next yeah, year. I know. Um, every time I listen to it, and that is often Mary, Mary can oh, contest, yeah. it's, it's one of my go to, this is what I'm listening to today albums. You know, it, it takes me back to that time in history. Crooked politicians, totalitarian organized religions, America bombing a country in the Middle East. And yet, the story, those lyrics, they could easily reflect the world of 2017. Um, you know, it's such a seminal, genre-changing work. But is it frustrating to you, as the artist, that many of the things you spoke out about in that album were, are things we're still dealing with 30 years later? Um. It, yeah, it's kind of surprising. Yeah, yeah. I I would have thought in my younger days that we would have uh, moved a little quicker as a world society, right. you know, at recognizing certain things and, and go about changing those things. Um, but as an older man now, I see that that's kind of the way civilization is. You know, we we move pretty slow. And changing our ideas, and it, it's sort of a generational thing. I've been coming you know? to the same. As one yeah. generation ends and and leaves, uh, you know, the next generation takes over, and, and some of those ideas that the last generation left cling to us, you know, kind of like uh, dog hair, you know, <laughs> and uh, we have to wipe that clean, you know. Yeah. And um, like, for instance, the, the the word socialism, for example, like. Uh, my generation is probably a lot um, more comfortable with the term socialism than my parents are. Agreed. And right. and right. their parents are absolutely not comfortable with that word, mm-hmm. you know. So you know when my parents are gone, uh, and and I'm in that position now, my kids think Bernie Sanders is, is great. They love his ideas. They can't understand why we haven't done that already, yep. you know. But you know. The, first, you know, the previous generations are going, socialist, oh, oh mad, yeah. equals communism. Yeah, <laughs> you know? it, it's, it's true. Because that's my, what they were sold. Yeah. Yeah. My, my oldest, is uh, he, he's 26 years old and uh, conceived after the Building Empires show in Hershey back in the day. By the way. <laughs> really? But, uh, yeah. But uh, 
<laughs> you know, he, he, was, he was a Bernie Sanders guy. And, uh, you know, my father, Vietnam era veteran, was not a Bernie Sanders guy. He was a Hillary guy. And, mm -hmm. and listening to the yeah. two of them debate it, it, it's very much a generational thing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but those, those concepts and um, situations that were happening within the mind crime story are, are just as prevalent today, like yeah. you said. Oh, I agree. Nothing's changed. I agree. And that's only been 30 years, you know. American Soldier, that, that's one of my personal favorites. That, that was an album of songs, you know, they were all war stories from the perspective of those serving in the military. Now, you spent several years interviewing veterans from World War II to Iraq, um, including your own father. Mm -hmm. and you collected their stories. Um, this is just a personal question for me. Have you ever considered turning those stories into a book? Like, a, 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 you know, all those interviews. I never thought about that. No, you should. Hmm. <laughs> I, would, I would read the hell out of that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. It um, would be interesting. It would be inter That was a fascinating project to be part of. I'm so, I feel very fortunate to have had that experience and um, and, and shared in those um, stories. I, I got to tell you, I think uh, post Empire, I, I think that's probably my favorite Queens Rike album, hmm. is American Soldier. Interesting. Um, I, I, that struck a chord with me. All right. Yeah, uh, you never know. You know, you never know as an artist how your work is going to affect somebody. Yeah, I mean, that's true. It, you you just put it out there. And things, uh, things have a life of their own, you know, for various reasons. Yeah. You know, uh, for example, like the Empire album, uh, that affected a lot of people because a lot of people heard it. Yeah. You know, the, yeah. there was a, was it was six, one, six million dollar um, promotional budget for that album. Jesus. You know, the last record I did had a promotional budget of three hundred dollars. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. so you know, you see the difference. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> can I ask a can I ask a question? Well, yeah, you're a co-host on the show. Okay. You're allowed. I'm re I've been recently promoted to co-host, so oh. I still congratulations. Feel, thank you, thank yeah. you. Um, what's your favorite album of all the ones you've ever done? Um, because you said you know, like you said that artists are never sure. Because we run into the same thing with books. Like the books oh, yeah. that we write, our favorite ones are never the ones that fans like the best. So which one? Which one is your personal favorite? Well, I have um, I, ha I set certain artistic goals for myself over time uh, and probably the first real artistic goal that I achieved that I felt strongly and good about was uh, the Promised Land album. I wanted to write a record that had a certain um, feeling throughout the entire record mm -hmm. and I'd never done that before. Every record had always had multiple sort of uh, kinds of songs on it. Uh, it was kind of like, a, I don't know how to explain explain it but different moods right right and I wanted right. I wanted to create a record that it, where you just hung in this certain feeling throughout mm -hmm. the record and and the trick was to uh, you know create create different colors within that mood but still retain that mood and I right. thought the closest that I got to that sort of uh, criteria was uh, promised land. I would agree, right. especially, yeah. and it all seems to culminate in that final title track. Hmm. You know, yeah, I, would, I think if that's what you set out to achieve, then yeah, yeah. as a fan, I, I think you did well. Good. Um, all right. But yeah, I know what you mean. It's like uh, you never know how your material is going to affect people. And, and people take it so differently. They do. You know, oh, like, yeah. um, I, like I, if you read my lyrics and you read interviews I've done, when people ask me about certain situations, I don't think it's very difficult to identify that I'm pretty liberal-minded. Right. right. You know, right. I've been traveling in 65 countries. I've seen a lot of things and met a lot of people and have been in a lot of situations. I'm pretty open-minded to the world, right? Right. Mm -hmm. But I have fans that are opposite of that. I mean. Yeah. incredibly opposite than that, you know? And right. I don't get that. I don't understand why that is, yeah. other than perhaps I can't read. <laughs> <laughs> that could be it. Or they just, they hear what they want to hear. You know? I, I think there's <laughs> there's an element of it. To, I, you know, my my novels have been praised by the, you know, the extreme left, the alt-right, and everybody in between, and... and I, you know, I'm not above keeping my mouth shut and letting them buy a book. Sure, but, you sure. Know, but I mean, I'm also not shy about expressing my, my own politics, you know. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a pretty left-leaning guy. And uh, I think if they, 
if they go beyond the books, they find that out pretty quick. But all right, so you, Mary, you said we're just about out of time here. Well, we gotta let Jeff go on. Minutes. It depends on all right, Uncle, Uncle, I'd cool. rather do this. Right. Um, we have to squeeze in loyal listener Paul Ligursky. He, he <laughs> demanded that that we ask this. Um, now this is his question, not mine. He says, "What was the inspiration to the greatest song ever, Roads to Madness?" And was it Jeff who came up with the phrase grand transition in the song? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, okay. I did. Um, the story I always give about that song, because I get asked this a lot yeah. about that particular song, is that uh, it was uh, early on in um, Queensryche's career, and um, I was feeling quite a lot of pressure to write. Um, we had just gotten signed, and right. that... And, and with that action, I felt very responsible now uh, to be um, productive. And uh, I think a, a bit of that, the pressure of being in that situation really affected me because I, I uh, started having trouble sleeping. And I'd never, ever had a problem sleeping in my whole life and still don't to this day. But at the beginning, after we got signed, I couldn't sleep. I was a nervous wreck. And uh, I went for like, weeks without getting a proper amount of sleep. Right. I'd, I'd sleep maybe 30 minutes, an hour, one day, two hours the next day, you know, things like that. So I was really sleep deprived and uh, wrote that song uh, under massive amounts of sleep <laughs> deprivation. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. There you go, Paul. All right, let's... Uh, a, there's bits of delirium in the lyrics <laughs> on that song. <laughs> All right. Let, all let's since we are the horror show, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about the Burning More Deaths. Now, Mary and I just watched it. What last weekend? It was. Yeah, yeah something like so. that. Last weekend, yeah. Um, yeah, we both agreed it was fucking creepy to see you as a psychotic killer. It was, and, I you, mean, were, and you were good, and I mean that in a good way. I don't mean that like yeah, you make a well, really I mean, good killer. I mean, we but. we know you from you know we <laughs> we were the couple in the fifth row at every show, and right, you know right. we know you from watching the, the videos over the years and, and interviews, but. I mean, your character was just so goddamn gleeful while he's killing these people yes. in horrible ways. How did you get into his head? I tell you, that was one of the toughest situations I've ever been in. Really? really? Yeah, I, really? Wasn't, I wasn't really prepared for what happened. Just being on this, <laughs> the set was miserable? The set was miserable. It was, it was uh, this uh, old military base out in Queens. Right. On the okay. on the water, right? And right. it was winter, and it was freezing cold, and snowing, and raining, and miserable. And uh, it was filmed inside these different barracks, mm -hmm. and uh, there were holes in the in the ceiling and the roofs, and it was leaking inside. There was mildew everywhere, oh, and God. people had vandalized these buildings and mm -hmm. done all kinds of who knows what, and it had really bad energy, right? right. And uh, but that really helped, sort of get into the headspace, you know. Yeah. And uh, I just uh, dressed up in the costume and didn't take a, a shower or a bath. I slept in those clothes, covered in artificial blood, oh, sticky that syrup, sticky and shit. Yeah. yeah. And I, I just, you know, I, I, I lived a lot of the time on the floor, yeah. you know, the wood floors of the building, and um, there was just caked dirt under my fingernails the so whole time. You, so and, you're you know, really worried. Character. I was, I was <laughs> method acting the whole time right now. <laughs> and I, I had a, I had a bit of a decompression to come out of that after the shooting. And, um, and then I got all upset about, I didn't want my kids to see this. Right. You know, Cause it's pretty violent and, and seeing like, your dad as this violent. Family, right? yeah. The, yeah. And seeing this, your dad as this violent character, I thought, I thought right. could have a real bad impact on my, on my kids, you know? And, um, so I, I, uh, Never let them watch it. Yeah, I ha I still haven't seen the movie. Yeah, really? yeah. I don't know what's in it or how it turned out or. Oh, you know what? Apparently, I wrote some music for it. You yeah, did. you, you scored the film. I yes. I don't have a recollection of the music on it. In fact, they <laughs> really? asked me the other day. They sent me the um, the oh, paperwork. So funny. After after I found out the movie was coming out, I contacted everybody and said, "Hey, is the movie coming out?" And they said, "Yeah." And I go, "Well, should we?" figure out what's going on with, the, with everything you know, like that. And they said, oh, yeah, well, you signed a bunch of stuff, and well, we'll send you what we have. And they sent me all these copies of contracts that I signed. But when it says, you know, music, it says to be determined. 
Say that you wrote the music. Yeah, they, oh. they've got you. And, and the keyboard score was great. It had a, a real John Carpenter vibe to it, you know. But I have to actually get a copy and listen to it and figure out what I did. I, I hope you get some royalties for this. <laughs> right. Do, no, I mean, it was, it was fascinating though because yeah. I, we're, we're movie. You know, we watch horror movies all the time, mm -hmm. and most of the time when I get to pick something, if it's not straight up monsters, then it's it's killers. Oh yeah. I have this like fascination with forensic stuff. I said, we have to watch this. He's, because it's basically John List and the Amityville guy, the, mm -hmm. the DeFeo, right? Yeah. Bonnie DeFeo. Yeah. If you kind of put them in a blender. Yeah, yeah. I'd say that was Only the inspiration cooler. for the movie. Yeah. <laughs> but it's Jeff Tate. But it's Jeff Tate's you know? cooler. Well, when it, was, when it was conceived and when it was shot, it was quite a while ago. And since then, a lot of films have come out that, that uh, it is sort of like now. Right. You right. know, so I think if it would have come out when it was right. know, first made, it would be a little bit different impact, you know, I think. Right. All right, so last question, then we'll let you uh, go chill before the concert. Um, Resurrection came out last September. Mm -hmm. You know, you're currently, as I said, on the, the whole story acoustic tour. Um, you're a grandfather now, as we discussed earlier. Oh, yeah. Now, you know, last year, I went on tour, what, baby, March? Yeah, I think it was March. And I came home in December, and... I've got a nine-year-old at home, and, and this was the first time I've done an extensive tour like that with somebody at home. It was tough for me. Do you, you know, as, as you becoming a granddad, do you still find you love it out here on the road, or are you anxious to get home? I'm pretty anxious to get home right yeah. now. Yeah, I've been out since uh, November. Yeah. So was that? November, December, January, 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 I'm at the end of my rope right now. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. a long time to tour. I, I told it is. Too, it's, you know, it's hard to be gone from your own bed and your own stuff. You know, for that long. Well, the funny thing is, while I've been on the road, my wife, who was a real estate agent, mm -hmm. sold our house. Yeah. Oh my. And <laughs> she bought another house. Oh. Okay. And moved all of our stuff into the new house, and is having the new house remodeled. And I haven't seen it yet. You haven't seen the house? <laughs> Just in photos, you know. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm going to go home and uh, unpack all my stuff that's not unpacked yet and find everything. And it's a new adventure. Where's the bathroom? Adventure. Yeah, I mean, where's the bathroom? <laughs> my first question will be. Yes, the first thing, where's the bathroom? All right, well, Jeff, the bus a long time. man, thank you so much. This oh, yeah. is an honor to have you. Yeah, well, you. I, we're doing good. We had Stephen King last week right. gave us a contribution. Jeff Tate this week. Next week, I think it's just Dave and I yammering to each other. So I, I don't know how we'll top this. Yeah, what do you talk about when you don't have guests? <laughs> <laughs> the internet never fails us. Oh, yeah, oh, the internet always sure. comes so. up with something fun. Yeah, there's always something I'm to talk sure about. I'm sure Trump will do something stupid. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jeff. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> thank you so much. And, and, and uh, our Canadian listeners, if you're catching this Thursday night, um, I believe uh, Toronto, and the day after this show airs. And our, Ottawa? And or Ottawa. Or no. Ottawa? Ottawa and Quebec City. Yeah, Ottawa, Ottawa, Quebec Ottawa City. the day after this show airs, and then Quebec City. So mm -hmm. please go check them out. Uh, just based on the sound check alone, you are in for a treat. Yes, it's, so. it really is hypnotizing, and I don't say that about many things. It really is it is Mary thought it was too. cute during sound check they did Eyes of a Stranger, just a, a, a fraction of Eyes of a Stranger and I had goosebumps, goosebumps. going up and down my arm. Yeah. Yeah. So. You know it's just I have to say, uh, of, of all the tours I've done, this one has been so special to me because uh, of a number of things. One, I've worked with two completely different bands on this tour. Right. right. Uh, which is phenomenal. The chance to be able to work with these these young players were very enthusiastic and very good players at right. that. Um, and I feel very fortunate and blessed to have had that association with them. Uh, secondly, this is the first tour I've done since probably the Mind Crime tour, first tour, uh, that I've done on uh, monitors without using in-ear monitors. No kidding. Yeah, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of what's going on in the room. Right. You know, not locked in right. my own little world. Right. And I, I can hear people talking and carrying on conversations, and it's affected how I do the show. I've really? turned it into kind of an improv thing where there's, there's times where I interrupt their conversation. I go, so what's going on? <laughs> what, what are we I'm talking sorry. about here? Because I, I, I want to, um, yeah. And it, it's so fun to do things like that because it's, uh, it, it takes 
kind of the showbiz element of a show out of it right. and all of a sudden right. brings it into reality. Right. It's more you know? intimate, I think. Right? It's very intimate. Oh, yeah. And there's a lot of storytelling. I talk about a lot of the, the songs and where my head was at during the song or what was happening with the band or I me. Won't, I won't song. lie. That's what I'm looking forward to tonight. Yeah. Mm. You know? yeah. yeah. Some of it's uh, pretty interesting. Others of it's total drivel but uh, <laughs> you decide which is wet <laughs> all right well jeff thank you so much man we appreciate it my pleasure all right dave back to you okay and we're back and once again this show was brought to you by husk by rachel autumn deering this all too real work of horror fiction explores the mind of a young man who has returned to his kentucky hometown after three years in Afghanistan. He's struggling with PTSD, drug, ad drug addiction, and self-doubt, but now something dark and brooding and mean is about to manifest his deepest, darkest fears. Sounds pretty good. It's really good, actually. I've read it. It's, it's really good. And that's available right yeah. now on Amazon in Kindle and in paperback. Um, you guys got anything else before we sign off? Um, not really. No, <laughs> you're done. Okay. I think so. uh, Jeff Tate broke you. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. I just want. I want to thank everybody on his team again. Yeah, they were great. For hosting Thanks us. Again that for was everything. great. I, what a great couple of weeks. The Robert Block episode right. last week with you know Stephen King and Paul Wilson and Wayne Allen Sally. Everybody that contributed to that. And and oh wait, Dave has something. <laughs> well, you mentioned Robert Block episode. That reminded me of something. Apparently. And again, uh, I'm not quite sure how this got started. People thought Stephen King was actually going to be on the show with us. And I'm not quite sure where this theory came from because we never said that. No, I <laughs> said, I, said I said they share, they share stories. Remember yes. stories. Yes. Because yeah. yeah. uh, somebody had, had contacted me. It's like, uh, if Stephen King's on the show, I want to buy ads. And I'm like, well, that's not going to happen anytime soon. But if it does, <laughs> I'll let you know. I can tell you right now, Stephen King's on the show. Most people aren't going to want to pay what we're going to yeah. charge for ads right, on that right. show. So, uh, Look, I, we'd okay. love to have them on, but we I don't think it's going to happen. We don't do Skype. We yeah. do shit in person. Yeah. Now, you explain to me on our budget yeah. <laughs> how I'm going to fly Stephen King, F. Paul Wilson, Tom Monteleon, Del Hallison, David Scow, John <laughs> Skip, Kathy Gonzalez, and Wayne Allen Sally mm -hmm. all here to my kitchen. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. We're going to need more chairs. Yes. Um, no, what I did is I, I emailed each of them. And I said, hey, we're doing a Robert Block Centennial. Can can you share a memory with me that I can read on the air? And each one of them, including Stephen King, was gracious enough to take time out of getting paid to write. Right. And write something mm -hmm. for us that they weren't getting paid for, um, which we then read. I And I we said nowhere that he was going to be I, in the I studio. I heard from a couple of people last week who were like, you know, oh, I thought Stephen King was going to be on your show. And I'm like, oh, where did you get this idea? Because we never said this. Yeah. You know? Clearly they did not turn up their volume. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This had to be on Facebook. Of course it was on Facebook. Where else is it on? Well, yeah. you know, then it's probably a, a case of people don't click through. They, yeah. they mm -hmm. read the little Facebook thing and, and people are stupid. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> well... Now I'm pissed. <laughs> I was feeling very good about the last two two weeks worth of episodes. Well, why, you know, no, it, why would you be mad? It's not your. If right. someone else is dumb, that's not your fault. Uh, if they're yeah. just reading, you know, yeah. so and so and so and so and so and so are all. I think I think a lot of people just. I, I could see how they'd misunderstand. They're looking. But, they're looking, and they see yeah. the name Stephen King, and, and they, they just stop think, because yeah. they're like, Stephen King's going to be on. He's going to tell me the secret to getting my zombie dog <laughs> versus ninjas opus published. I'm. This is this is the week. I'm gonna learn the secret because Brian won't tell us. So maybe Stephen King will tell us. Yeah. You know, You're because, holding out on the yeah, zombie dog yeah. versus ninja market. Yeah. I clearly. Just, uh, clearly, I said, Brian. Yeah. I hate people. I know. <laughs> but you know who I don't hate? Uh, you, dear listeners. I don't hate you. And if there's something you want us to talk about, hit us up on Twitter, Facebook, or our website, The Horror Show with Brian Keen dot com. Unless you're a stupid person. Uh, the <laughs> we, hard... love, we love you too, stupid people. We no, do. Mary loves you. I love everybody. <laughs> Dave and I have no tolerance for you. <laughs> you know damn well what Coop thinks of you. Yes. <laughs> uh, Dungeon Master will not tolerate you. That's true. <laughs> Phoebe and Lombardo may also like you. Yeah, so, nah, I wouldn't go that far. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> All right, well, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I wouldn't go I that I think far. you're kind of stuck with me, guys. Yeah, that's pretty much it. The Horror Show is available on iTunes, Android, Roku, Stitcher, Google Play Music, and all 
other platforms via the Project Entertainment Network. Uh, please visit their patron and consider supporting them. You can get really cool Horror Show with Brian Keene bumper stickers <gasps> oh, yeah, only right. on their patron. That's I true. Didn't know that. Yes. Um, and of course, the most important thing to advertise on the Horror Show, send an email to Dave. His email address is meteornotes at gmail.com. That's meteor notes at gmail.com meteor uh, like the thing that's going to come very close to the earth yeah make your subject line food shopping or can you introduce me to Stephen king no, or something like that seriously don't do that because it, it, <laughs> it if it goes in my spam mailbox it's nothing but canadian Vi- viagra ads and uh things like one day i still don't understand this I, I i go in there to look to see what's in there sometimes and there was a, there was a, a subject matter that said this made hitler cry and i'm like I'm not clicking on this. <laughs> but you kind of want to know. Yeah, I want to yeah. know, but I don't want to know. know. But uh, Canadian Viagra means I'm getting Ron Dickey's email again. So <laughs> It made Hitler cry. Yeah. That could be... <laughs> Could that be Nick Spencer's run on Captain America? Uh, possibly. Could yeah. that be comic book writer Mark Wade threatening to punch a journalist? Yes. Oh, Could that be the melt PR meltdown that Marvel Comics started experiencing two weeks ago and it's still continuing? It's still going on, yes. I don't think Hitler would know about that. <laughs> well, you know what? I think we should finally talk about that next week. Yes. I keep looking for a place to end this Marvel but it story does stop. report on. <laughs> yeah, it but it's stop. not ending. But it's not yeah. ending. Over right. the weekend, uh, the artist on X Men Gold, we find out he put anti Semitic and anti Christian messages in the art. I, mean, I saw it, that, yeah. Yeah, I saw that too. Marvel. Marvel people, try not to fuck up for one week <laughs> so that we can accurately report on this story. Yes. Try not to fuck up for one week would actually be a really good goal for pretty much anybody yeah. when you think about it. Yeah, so, you know. So, I try, it should be on a t-shirt. I, I try not to. Try but, not to know, fuck I'm up idiot, this week. So. Also coming up, our boss, Armand Rosamilia, is going to return to the studio here in a couple weeks. Nice. Um, we're going to talk to him about podcasting. and Because and, we, we've talked to him about writing. I want to talk to him about podcasting and, and what it's like to, to ride herd over a, a diverse group of, <laughs> of podcasters, such as Dave and myself. Well, I mean, you got talent like Dave and me, and then you've got, you know, Golden and Moore and Mayberry over there, three guys with beards. And, and you got John Urbansick, who I, I, he's doing like tantric sex podcasts. <laughs> I, I'm not sure what he's got going on over there. I thought um, that your your uh, suggestion that he needs the music behind him, like Venus Flytrap from WKRP, was a genius. <laughs> he does. He does. No, you're right. You're absolutely right. Because I was listening to it, and I'm like, if he had music by it would be even better. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. Hey, this is John Urbansick. And for the next hour, we're going to talk uh, art and creativity. And I'm going to teach you how to make a woman come with just your mind. <laughs> <laughs> it's like Bob Ross has gone in a totally different direction. Yeah, people, All right. People keep asking me, they're like, how come you don't do a podcast? Because <laughs> I don't want to go up against these two. <laughs> well, don't, don't, you can't do a podcast. You're on our podcast. I know. Well, now. that's 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 actually we got to figure out when we're going to do uh, Mary and Phoebe movie night, though. That's yeah. Because we knew Dean to get that yeah. Oh, yeah. recorded at some point. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, I, I wonder if anybody's listening. Because people know after that final ad that. All we do is is list what's coming up. Have but people see, tuned if, out? Because if yeah. so, they're missing. They're this. missing all of our if you're, answer, if you're yeah. a Stern Show fan, you know never to turn off the show before it's over because some of the best things right. ever happened to that show happened, happened after, after we they, say we're going to stop after talking. After they, they did the plugs. Right. Mm-hmm. I still say my favorite moment ever on Stern was they did the plugs one day, and then for an hour and a half afterwards, <laughs> 90 minutes, they made fun of Jackie. <laughs> I don't know if you remember this. It's like, when he, yeah, the Jenny, the Jenny, hey, how's it going? Yeah. For 90 minutes, because you know, they all want to go home, and they do another hour and a half where they're just busting Jackie's balls. It's one of the funniest things I've ever heard. To me, that is like, that's the best kind of broadcast. It's not scripted yes. at all. It just it just randomly happens, which is like when we have our little sides here where I yell at people because I hate people. Um, I think that's what's entertaining. So right, there you go. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Suck it, three guys with beards. <laughs> No, see, now we have to include the disclaimer for stupid people. No, that, we don't. That we love those guys I, and we get along. I've and... said it a million times. If I if I don't like you, I just won't talk about you. Right. So right. there you go. Yeah. But see, you can't say that, too, because we didn't mention Amber Fallon this week. Now Amber's going to think you don't like her. Amber knows I like her. I've been talking to Amber uh, a lot. Frank Edler. He's going, well, well, why, why didn't you Why didn't you mention on my podcast? <laughs> Who? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Damn. Yeah. All right. I love you, Frank. <laughs> yeah, Frank's, Frank's awesome. I just, I, you know, I have to pick on these people. You know, they have to, you know, 
All right. Well, I I guess that's the end of the show. That's all I got. Yeah. 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 I'm I'm spent. Yeah. Bye. We'll see you next week. <laughs> How do people who make stuff up for a living make stuff up? New York Times bestseller Jonathan Mayberry told us... Oprah's book club favorite Sue Miller told us... You know, you sort of take a character and make some bad things happen. How'd we get them to do that? We colored them, just like at a cocktail party, except through your headphones. Join us every Thursday for the Liars Club Oddcast. A slightly unhinged podcast where storytellers interview other storytellers. Available on Project Entertainment Network, iTunes, and everywhere podcasts are heard. Thank you.